Hi, thank you for joining me today. We're reading from A Course in Miracles, the main text, and we are on chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream. This is another long chapter, so um, I expect we'll probably have to break it into two readings. The Passing of the Dream, the Substitute Reality, Section 1. To substitute is to accept instead. If you would but consider exactly what this entails, you would perceive at once how much at variance this is with the goal the Holy Spirit has given you and would accomplish for you. To substitute is to choose between renouncing one aspect of the sonship in favor of the other. For this special purpose, one is judged more valuable and the other is replaced by him. The relationship in which the substitution occurred is thus fragmented and its purpose split accordingly. To fragment is to exclude, and substitution is the strongest defense the ego has for separation. The Holy Spirit never substitutes. Where the ego perceives one person as a replacement for another, the Holy Spirit sees them as joined and indivisible. He does not judge between them, knowing they are one. Being united, they are one because they are the same. Substitution is clearly a process in which they are perceived as different. One would unite, the other separate. Nothing can come between what God has joined and what the Holy Spirit sees as one but everything seems to come between the fragmented relationships the ego sponsors to destroy. The one emotion in which substitution is impossible is love. Fear involves substitution by definition for its love's replacement. Fear is both a fragmented and a fragmenting emotion. It seems to take many forms, and each one seems to require a different form of acting out for satisfaction. While this appears to introduce quite variable behavior, a far more serious effect lies in the fragmented perception from which the behavior stems. No one is seen as complete. The body is emphasized with special emphasis on certain parts and used as the standard for comparison of acceptance or rejection for acting out a special form of fear. You who believe that God is made, is fear made but one substitution. It has taken many forms because it was the substitution of illusion for truth, of fragmentation for wholeness. It has become so splintered and subdivided and divided again over and over, that it is now almost impossible to perceive it once as one, and it still is what it was. That one error which brought truth to illusion, infinity to time, and life to death, was all you ever made. Your whole world rests upon it. Everything you see reflects it and every special relationship that you have ever made is part of it. You may be surprised to hear how differently is reality from what you see. You do not realize the magnitude of that one error. It was so vast and so completely incredible that from it a world of total unreality had to emerge. What else could come of it? Its fragmented aspects are fearful enough as you begin to look at them. But nothing you have seen begins to show you the enormity of the original error, which seemed to cast you out of heaven, to shatter knowledge into meaningless bits of disunited perceptions, and to force you to make further substitutions. That was the first projection of error outward. The world arose to hide it and became the screen on which it was projected and drawn between you and the truth. For truth extends inward where the idea of loss is meaningless and only increase is conceivable. 
Do you really think it's strange that a world in which everything is backwards and upside down arose from this projection of error? For truth brought to this could only remain within quiet and take no part at all the mad projection by which the world has made. Call it not sin, but madness for which it was and so still remains. Invest it not with guilt, for guilt implies it was accomplished in reality. And above all, be not afraid of it. When you seem to see some twisted form of the original error rising to frighten you, say only, God is not fear but love, and it will disappear. The truth will save you. It has not left you to go out into the mad world and so depart from you. Inward is sanity. Insanity is outside you. You but believe is the other way, that truth is outside and error and guilt within. Your little senseless substitutions, touched with insanity and swirling lightly off on a mad course like feathers dancing insanely in the wind, have no substance. They fuse and merge and separate in shifting and totally meaningless patterns that need not be judged at all. To judge them individually is pointless. Their tiny differences in form are no real differences at all. None of these, none of them matter. That they have in common and nothing else. Yet what else is necessary to make them all the same? Let them all go, dancing in the wind, dipping and turning till they disappear from sight far outside of you. And turn you to the stately calm within, wherein holy stillness dwells the living God you never left, and who never left you. The Holy Spirit takes you gently by the hand and retraces with your mad journey outside yourself, leading you gently back to the truth and safety within. He brings all your insane projections and the wild substitutions that you have placed outside you to the truth. Thus, he reverses the course of insanity and restores you to reason. In your relationship with your brother, where he has taken charge of everything at your request, he has set the course inward to the truth you share. In the mad world outside, in, in the mad world outside you, nothing can be shared but only substituted, and sharing and substituting have nothing in common in reality. Within yourself, you love your brother with a perfect love. Here is holy ground, in which no substitution can enter, and where only the truth in one another can abide. Here you are joined in God, as much together as you are with him. The original error has not entered here, nor ever will. Here is the radiant truth to which the Holy Spirit has committed your relationship. Let him bring it here where you would have it be. Give him but a little faith in your brother to help him show you that no substitute he made for heaven can keep you from it. In you there is no separation and no substitute can keep you from your brother. Your reality was God's creation and has no substitute. You are so firmly joined in truth that only God is there. And he would never accept something ex else instead of you. He loves you both equally and as one. And as he loves you, so you are. You are not joined together in illusions, but in the thoughts so holy and so perfect that illusions cannot remain to darken the holy place in which you stand together. God is with you, my brother. Let us join him in peace and gratitude and accept his gift as our most holy and perfect reality, which we share in him. 
Heaven is restored to all the sonship through your relationship, for, a, for in it lies the sonship, whole and beautiful, safe in your love. Heaven has entered quietly, for all illusions have been gently brought unto the truth in you. And love has shined upon you, blessing your relationship with truth. God and his whole creation have entered it together. How lovely and how holy is your relationship with the truth shining upon it. Heaven beholds it and rejoices that you have let it come with you. The universe within you stands with you together, and heaven looks with love on what is joined in it, along with its creator. Whom God has called should hear no substitutes. Their call is but an echo of the original error that shattered heaven, and what became of peace in those who heard. Return with me to heaven, walking together out of this world and through another, to the loveliness and joy the other holds within it. Would you further weaken and break apart what is already broken and helpless? Is it here that you would look for happiness? Or would you not prefer to heal what has been broken and join in making whole what has been ravaged by separation and disease? You have been called together with your brother to the most holy function this world contains. It is the only one that has no limits and reaches out to every broken fragment of the sonship with healing and uniting comfort. This is offered you in your holy relationship. Accept it here and you will give as you have accepted. The peace of God is given you with the glowing purpose in which you join. The holy light that brought you together must extend as you accepted it. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream, Section 2, The Basis of the Dream. Does not a world that seems quite real arise in dreams? Yet think what this world is. It is clearly not the world you saw before you slept. Rather, it is a distortion of the world, planned solely around what you have preferred. Here you are free to make over whatever seemed to attack you and to change it into a tribute to your ego which was outraged by the attack. This would not be your wish unless you saw yourself as one with the ego, which always looks upon itself and therefore on you as under attack and highly vulnerable to it. Dreams are chaotic because they are governed by your conflicting wishes and therefore they have no concern with what is true. They are the best example you could have of how perception can be utilized to substitute illusions for truth. You do not take them seriously on awakening because the fact that reality is so outrageously violated in them becomes apparent. Yet they are a way of looking at the world and changing it to suit the ego better. They provide striking examples both of the ego's inability to tolerate reality and of your willingness to change reality on its behalf. You do not find the differences between what you see in sleep and on awakening disturbing. You recognize that what you see on awakening is blotted out in dreams. Yet on awakening, you do not expect it to be gone. In dreams, you arrange everything. People come what you would have them be, and what, you would, and what they do, you order. No limits on substitution are laid upon you. For a time, it seems as if the world were given you to make it what you wish. You do not realize you are attacking it, trying to triumph over it and make it serve you. 
dreams are perceptual temper tantrums in which you literally scream, I want thus, and thus it seems to be. And yet the dream cannot escape its origin. Anger and fear pervade it. And in an instant, the illusions of satisfaction is satisfied by the illusion of terror. For the dream of your ability to control reality by substituting a world that you prefer is terrifying. Your attempts to blot out reality are very fearful. But this you are not willing to accept. And so you substitute the fantasy that reality is fearful, not what you would do to it. And thus is guilt made real. Dreams show you that you have the power to make a world as you would have it be, and that because you want to, and, and that because you want it, you see it. And while you see it, you have no doubt that it's real. Yet here is a world clearly within your mind that seems to be outside. You do not respond to it as though you made it nor do you realize that the emotions the dream produces must come from you. It is the figures in the dream and what they do that seem to make the dream. You do not realize that you are making them act out for you. For if you did, the guilt would not be theirs and the illusion of satisfaction would be gone. In dreams, these features are not obscure. You seem to waken and the dream is gone. Yet what you fail to recognize is that what caused the dream has not gone with it. Your wish to make another world that is not real remains with you. And what you seem to waken to is but another form of this same world you see in dreams. All your time is spent in dreaming. Your sleeping and your waking dreams have different forms, and that is all. Their content is the same. They are your protest against reality and your fixed and insane idea that you can change it. In your waking dreams, the special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality and to prevent yourself from waking. And while you see more value in sleeping than in waking, you will not let it go, let go of it. The Holy Spirit, ever practical in his wisdom, accepts your dreams and uses them as a means for waking. You would have used them to remain asleep. I said before that the first change before dreams disappear is that your dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. That is what the Holy Spirit does in the special relationship. He does not destroy it nor snatch it away from you. The special relationship will remain, not as a source of pain and guilt, but as a source of joy and freedom. It will not be for you alone, for therein lies its misery. As its unholiness kept it a thing apart, its holiness will become an offering to everyone. Your special relationship will be a means for undoing guilt in everyone, blessed through your holy relationship. It will be a happy dream and one which you will share with all who come within your sight. Through it, the blessing the Holy Spirit has laid upon it will be extended. Think not that he has forgotten anyone in the purpose he has given you. And think not that he has forgotten you to whom he gave the gift. He uses everyone who calls on him as means for the salvation of everyone. And he will awaken everyone through you who offended your relationship to him. If you but recognized his gratitude or mine through his. For we are joined as in one purpose, being of one mind with him. Let not the dream take hold to close your eyes. It is not strange that dreams can make a world that is unreal. It is the wish to make 
that is incredible. Your relationship with your brother has now become one in which the wish has been removed because its purpose has been changed from one of dreams to one of truth. You are not sure of this because you think it may be this that is the dream. You are so used to choosing among dreams, you do not see that you have made at last the choice between the truth and all illusions. Yet heaven is sure. This is no dream. Its coming means that you have chosen truth, and it has come because you have been willing to let your special relationship meet its conditions. In your relationship with the Holy Spirit, in your relationship, the Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world, the world of happy dreams, from which awakening is so easy and so natural. For as your sleeping and your waking dreams represent the same wishes in your mind, so do the real world and the truth of heaven join in the will of God. The dream of waking is easily transferred to its reality. For this dream reflects your will joined with the will of God. And what this will would have accomplished has never not been done. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream, Section 3, Light in the Dream. You who have spent your life in bringing truth to illusion reality to fantasy, have walked the way of dreams. For you have gone from walking, or rather from waking to sleeping, and on and on to a yet deeper sleep. Each dream has led to other dreams, and every fantasy that seemed to bring a light into the darkness, but made the darkness deeper. Your goal was darkness, in which no ray of light could enter. And you sought a blackness so complete that you could hide from truth forever in complete insanity. What you forgot was simply that God cannot destroy itself. The light is in you. Darkness can cover it, but it cannot put it out. As the light comes nearer, you will rush to darkness, shrinking from the truth sometimes retreating to the lesser forms of fear and sometimes to stark terror. But you will advance because your goal is the advance from fear to truth. The goal you accepted is the goal of knowledge for which you cited your willingness or, or from, for which you signified your willingness. Fear seems to live in darkness. And when you are afraid, you have stepped back. Let us then join quickly in an instant of light, and it will be enough to remind you that your goal is light. Truth has rushed to meet you since you, call, we, you called upon it. If you knew who walks beside you on the way that you have chosen, fear would be impossible. You do not know because the journey into darkness has been long and cruel and you have gone deep into it. A little flicker of your eyelids closed so long has not been sufficient to give you confidence in yourself so long despised. You go toward love still hating it and terribly afraid of its judgment upon you. And you do not realize that you are not afraid of love but only of what you have made of it. You are advancing to love's meaning and away from all illusions in which you have surrounded it. When you retreat to the illusion, your fear increases, for there is little doubt that what you think it means is fearful. Yet what is it? What is that to us who travel surely and very swiftly away from fear? You who hold your brother's hand also hold mine, for when you joined each other, you were not alone. Do you believe that I would leave you in the darkness that you agreed to leave with me? In your relationship is this world's light, 
and fear must disappear before you now. Be tempted not to snatch away the gift of faith you offered to your brother. You will succeed only in frightening yourself. The gift is given forever, for God himself received it. You cannot take it back. You have accepted God. The holiness of your relationship is established in heaven. You do not understand what you accepted, but remember that your understanding is not necessary. All that was necessary was merely the wish to understand. That wish was the desire to be holy. The will of God is granted you, for you desire the only thing you ever had or ever were. Each instant that we spend together will teach you that this goal is possible and will strengthen your desire to reach it. And in your desire lies its accomplishment. Your desire is now in complete accord with all the power of the Holy Spirit's will. No little faltering footsteps that you may take can separate your desire from his will and his strength. I hold your hand as surely as you agreed to take your brothers. You will not separate, for I stand with you and walk with you in your advance to truth. And where we go, we carry God with us. In your relationship, you have joined with me in bringing heaven to the Son of God, who hid in darkness. You have been willing to bring the darkness to light, and this willingness has given strength to everyone who would remain in darkness. Those who would see will see, and they will join me in carrying their light into the darkness when the darkness in them is offered to the light and is removed forever. My need for you joined with me in the holy light of your relationship is your need for salvation. Would I not give you what you gave to me? For when you joined your brother, you answered me. You, who are now the bringer of salvation, have the function of bringing light to darkness. The darkness in you has been brought to light. Carry it back to darkness from the holy instant to which you brought it. We are made whole in our desire to make whole. Let not time worry you, for all the fear that you and your brother experience is really past. Time has been readjusted to help us do together what your separate pasts would hinder. You have gone past fear, for no two minds can join in the desire for love without love's joining them. Not one light in heaven but goes with you. Not one ray that shines forever in the mind of God, but shines on you. Heaven is joined with you in your advance to heaven. When such great lights have joined with you to give the little spark of your desire, the power of God himself, can you, can you remain in darkness? You are coming home together after a long and meaningless journey that you undertook apart and that led nowhere. You have found your brother, and you will light each other's way. And from this light will come the great rays, extend back into darkness and forward unto God, to shine away the past, and so make room for his eternal presence, in which everything is radiant in the light. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream Section 4, The Little Willingness. The holy instant is the result of your determination to be holy. It is the answer. The desire and the willingness to let it come precede its meaning. I'm sorry, precede its coming. The desire and the willingness to let it come precede its coming. You prepare your mind for it only to the extent of recognizing that you want it above all else. It is not necessary that you do more. Indeed, it is necessary that you realize you cannot do more. 
Do not attempt to give the Holy Spirit what he does not ask, or you will add the ego to him and confuse the two. He asks but little. It is he who adds the greatness and the might. He joins with you to make the holy instant far greater than you can understand. It is your realization that you need to do so little that enables him to give so much. Trust not your good intentions. They are not enough. But trust implicitly your willingness, whatever else may enter. Concentrate only on this and be not disturbed that shadows surround it. That is why you came. If you could not come without them, you would not need the holy instant. Come to it, not in arrogance, assuming that you must achieve the state its coming brings with it. The miracle of the holy instant lies in your willingness to let it be what it is. And in your willingness for this lies also your acceptance of yourself as you were meant to be. Humility will never ask that you remain content with littleness, but it does require that you be not content with less than greatness that comes not of you. Your difficulty with the holy instant arises from your fixed conviction that you are not worthy of it. And what is this but the determination to be as you would have made yourself? God did not create his dwelling place unworthy of him. And if you believe he cannot enter where he wills to be, you must be interfering with his will. You do not need the strength of willingness to come from you, but only from his will. The holy instant does not come from your little willingness alone. It is always the result of your willingness combined with the unlimited power of God's will. You have been wrong in thinking that what is needed, that is needful to holiness and not believe that it is up to you to establish the conditions for peace. God has established them. They do not wait on your willingness for what they are. Your willingness is needed only to make it possible to teach you what they are. If you remain, you are unworthy of learning. If you maintain you are unworthy of learning this, you are interfering with the lesson by believing that you must make the learner different. You did not make the learner, nor can you make him different. Would you first make a miracle yourself and then expect one to be made for you? You merely ask the question. The answer is given. Seek not to answer, but merely to receive the answer as is given. In preparing for the holy instant, do not attempt to make yourself holy to be ready to receive it. That is but to confuse your role with God's. Atonement cannot come to those who think that they must first atone, but only to those who offer it nothing more than a simple, simple willingness to make way for it. Purification is of God alone, and therefore for you. Rather than seek to prepare thy, yourself for him, try to think thus. I who am host to God am worthy of him. He who established his dwelling place in me created it as he would have it. It is not needful that I make it ready for him but only that I do not interfere with his plan to restore to me my own awareness of my readiness, which is eternal. I need add nothing to his plan, but to receive it I must be willing not to substitute my own plan in place of it. And that is all. Add more and you will merely take away the little that is asked. Remember, you made guilt, and that your plan for the escape from guilt has been to bring atonement to it and make salvation fearful. And it is only fear that you will add if you prepare yourself for love. The preparation for the holy instant belongs to him who gives it. 
release yourself to him whose function is release. Do not assume his function for him. Give him but what he asks that you may learn how little your part and how great is his. It is this that makes the holy instant so easy and so natural. You make it difficult because you insist there must be more that you need to do. And it is very hard for you to realize it is not personally insulting that your contribution and the Holy Spirit's are so extremely disproportionate. You are still convinced that your understanding is a powerful contribution to the truth and makes it what it is. Yet we have emphasized that you need to understand nothing. Salvation is easy just because it asks nothing you cannot give right now. Forget not that it has been your decision to make everything that is natural and easy for you impossible. If you believe the old holy instant is difficult for you, it's because you have become the arbitrator of what is possible and remain unwilling to give place to one who knows. The whole belief in orders of difficulty and miracles is centered on this. Everything God wills is not only possible, but has already happened. And, what, and that is why the past has gone. It never happened in reality. Only in your mind, which thought it did, is its undoing needful. I think we'll do one more section. Chapter 18. The Passing of the Dream, Section 5, The Happy Dream. Prepare you now for the undoing of what never was. If you already understood the difference between truth and illusion, the atonement would have no meaning. The holy instant, the holy relationship, the Holy Spirit's teaching, and all the teachings by which salvation is accomplished would have no purpose for they are all but aspects of the plan to change your dreams of fear to happy dreams, from which you awaken easily to knowledge. Put yourself not in charge of this, for you cannot distinguish between advance and retreat. Some of your greatest advances you have judged as failures, and some of your deepest retreats you have evaluated as success. Never approach the holy instant after you have tried to remove all fear and hatred from your mind. That is its function. Never attempt to overlook your guilt before you ask the Holy Spirit's help. That is his function. Your part is only to offer him a little willingness to let him remove all fear and hatred and to be forgiven. On your little faith, joined with his understanding, he will build your part in the atonement and make sure that you fulfill it easily. And with him, you will build a ladder planted in the solid rock of faith, rising even to heaven. Nor will you use it to ascend to heaven alone. Through your re holy relationship, reborn and blessed in every holy instant you do not arrange, thousands will rise to heaven with you. Can you plan for this? Or could you prepare yourself for such a function? Yet it is possible because God wills it. Nor will he change his mind about it. The means and purpose both belong to him. You have accepted one, the other will be provided. A purpose such as this, without the means, is inconceivable. He will provide the means to anyone who shares his purpose. Happy dreams come true, not because they are dreams, but only because they are happy, and so they must be loving. Their message is, thy will be done, and not, I want it otherwise. The alignment of means and purpose is an undertaking impossible for you to understand. You do not even realize you have accepted the Holy Spirit's purpose as your own and you would merely bring unholy means to its accomplishment. The little faith it needed to change the purpose is all that is required to receive the means and use them. 
It is no dream to love your father, your brother as yourself, nor is your holy relationship a dream. All that remains of dreams within it is that it is still a special relationship. Yet it is very useful to the Holy Spirit, who has a special function here. It will become the happy dream through which he can spend joy to thousands on thousands who believe that love is fear, not happiness. Let him fulfill the function that he gave to your relationship by accepting it for you, and nothing will be wanting that would make it of what he would have it be. When you feel the holiness of your relationship is threatened by anything, stop instantly and offer the Holy Spirit your willingness, in spite of fear, to let him exchange this instant for the Holy One that you would rather have. He will never fail in this. But forget not that your relationship is one, and so it must be whatever threatens the peace of one is an equal threat to, be, to the other. The power of joining its blessing lies in the fact that it is now impossible for you or your brother to experience fear alone or to attempt to deal with it alone. Never believe that this is necessary or even possible. Yet just as this is impossible, so it is equally impossible that the holy instant came to either of you without the other, and it will come to both at the request of either. Whoever is saner at the time the threat is perceived should remember how deep in his indebtedness to the other and how much gratitude is due him and be glad that he can pay his debt by bringing happiness to both. Let him remember this and say, I desire this holy instant for myself that I may share it with my brother whom I love. It is not possible that I can have it without him or he without me. Yet it is wholly possible for us to share it now. And so I choose this instant as the one to offer the Holy Spirit, that his blessing may descend on us and keep us both in peace. I think we'll stop here for today and we'll pick up We've got the next four sections of this chapter to read for next week. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this section of this chapter. And um, I hope to see you here next week for the final reading of this chapter 18. Much love and namaste.